Hello, this is Kylo Wirth of AAII. We are talking about the latest and greatest from the world of finance and investing for the individual investor. We're broadcasting, and if you're watching this in the archive, we post our upcoming live show schedule on AAII.com slash webinars, and AAII members will have access to the full archive of shows. Our guests today are Derek Hageman, Adam Shegg, Dylan Deese, and Jack Vogel. Today's show has three topics. First, we take a look at what buy stocks are and which of these stocks passed growth screen. Next, we compare the six most popular money transfer apps. Finally, we take a look into factors and how they can help the individual investor predict stocks. Let's get started. Hi, today I'm joined by Derek Hageman as we bring Miami Vice into the world of stocks. That's right, we're talking about buy stocks and how you should go about approaching these set of stocks. Hi Derek, how are you doing today? I'm good, very excited to, to go down uh, Miami Vice uh, memory lane, so I, li I like that. <laughs> All right, let's hop right into this. Hearing the word vice might scare away some investors who associate the industries represented in that category with risky and volatile. For any investors apprehensive about plunging into these markets, is there any truth to that fear? Or are vice stocks that pass the growth screen no riskier than any other stock you would look at? Well, it's a it's a good question. Um, I think to start and just to get everyone up to speed from a investing standpoint, um, the consensus vice or so-called sin stocks, they're alcohol, uh, gaming, so so think of gambling and tobacco. Um, these industries, you know, these are industries that some may object to investing in due to personal beliefs and some broader definitions of vice industries include cannabis and defense as well. So similar to, to ESG investing, investing in vice stocks, it, it remains a, a very personal decision and vice investors need it need to take the time to look under the hood uh, themselves and understand if the stocks are aligned with their own values uh, typically most investors don't actively seek out so-called vice stocks uh, and due to their controversial businesses some companies are deemed not worth the trouble to engage with However, for, for investors, I think any viable alternative should be open uh, for consideration. And lastly, I'll just add, um, but for those who are still hesitant to buy vice stocks, a reason to at least be open to vice stocks is market performance. Many of these stocks are high quality companies with strong financials and a history of solid market performance. The two industries that passed the growth screen were aerospace and defense and brewers. Each of these industries has their own set of factors and influences that affect their stock. Does the growth screen take into account these differences when measuring the industries against each other? Yeah, so as you said, we, we chose to focus on a growth-oriented strategy and specifically re, we required stocks to have realized higher revenue growth than their industry peers over both the past five years and the past 12 months. And this really narrows the results to the companies with the highest growth rates within their respective industries. So we didn't measure the industries against one another, but we measured stocks within an industry. They were the ones that were measured against one another. So aerospace and defense companies were measured against other aerospace and defense companies while brewers were evalu evaluated against other brewers. The article references alcohol, gambling, and tobacco, which you mentioned earlier, as examples of vice investments. Another drug that could fall into this category is cannabis, which you again mentioned earlier, especially as more and more states across the country are starting to legalize the drug for recreational use. Does the vice stock screen give any consideration to companies that sell cannabis legally in the U.S., even though the drug is not nationally legalized? Yes, the, the vice stock screen considers companies that sell cannabis legally in the U.S. And as I mentioned earlier, some broader definitions of vice industries, it does include cannabis. And you are correct that more and more states across the country are legalizing the drug for, for recreational use. It is still illegal on a uh, illegal on a federal basis, though, 
but for the article, uh, we manually screened for cannabis stocks in the pharmaceuticals industry. We did not find any cannabis related stocks that, that passed the screen at this moment though. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Derek. Uh, if you'd like to read Derek's article, Guns, Drugs and Warfare, Thematic Investing for Vice Stocks or Others Like It, you can find it in the August Journal at AAII.com. Thank you once again, Derek. Have a great day. All right. Thanks, Kyler. Have a good one. Thank you. Today, I am joined by Adam Shegg and Dylan Deese to talk about their article on the six most popular cash apps. Would you both like to introduce yourselves? Hi, everyone. I'm Dylan Deese. I'm part of the research team at the American Association of Individual Investors, and I'm excited to be here with you all today. Hello, all. I'm Adam Shegg, also a research intern and equally excited to be here today. Well, I'm very excited to have you both here. Uh, let's hop right into it. It is no reach to say that our world is becoming increasingly digitalized, from our entertainment to communication and even to our workplace. Cash apps are just another example in the long list of changes that have come in the past decade. Is there any possibility that with the popularity of these apps and the increased digitalization, that physical currency will become obsolete? Um, I think the biggest thing about cash apps right now is that they provide um, consumers with an alternate um, form of payment. So while it is possible in, in the future that we could see them replace um, your typical currency, I think right now the I think the main goal is to get everyone sort of familiar with them, comfortable with them, and then we can move forward from there. When choosing which cash app to use, do you think demographics like age play a role? A younger demographic might prefer an app like Venmo because there are no transfer charges and it is unlikely that they would need to send more than $5,000 at one time. On the other hand, someone with a full-time job and more money than let's say a college student might be willing to bite the debits credit fees in order to transfer more money and have access to international locations that comes with Google Pay. Yeah, I think age definitely has a, a major role when choosing these apps, uh, primarily because uh, you know each different age group wants different things from their service. So, for example, then most kind of a more uh, social app. And maybe, you know, you need that other account and you might have less security features with that where someone who's older might prefer Zelle just going straight bank to bank. Um, and it's a safer um, platform. So I think that has a, a major role in determining which one you look at. And ultimately, you have to also look at just your payment, what type of payments you're planning on making. So for Venmo, smaller, you know, day to day transactions, what they specialize in. So if you're looking at doing those payments that's probably the best app for you versus zelle deals with larger payments and again you're transferring from one bank account to the other so i think that that would be the better one in that scenario in the article you review and compare the six most popular transfer apps hence the name were there other transfer apps you were looking at and if so why were they left out of the article there were certainly others in consideration uh, however, as the article title says, they are the most popular and prevalent in the U.S. Um, other options, such as a world remit, are popular, um, but more specific to international payments, hence why we more so focused on ones that would be typically used between uh, U.S. transactions, specifically. And finally, the article highlights the notable differences between the cash apps because of those differences. Is it worth the individual investor using more than one of those apps for different occasions? And how many apps would you suggest they use? Uh, certainly is. I think the best way to use the transfer apps is to use multiple of them. Personally, I have accounts with four, but really use Zelle and Venmo most frequently from paying my rent to uh, transactions between friends. Uh, I, I really do like Venmo. I think it's the most efficient and the easiest to use. Uh, but obviously, as we discussed, there's transaction fees with most apps. So choosing the one that best fits your needs uh, and, and using those concurrently with others is the best way to go about it. Thank you, Adam and Dylan.
if you are interested in reading their article, Comparing the Six Most Popular Money Transfer Apps or Others Like It, you can find them in the August Journal at AII.com. Once again, thank you both for being here. Thank you for having me. Have a great day. So Jack, uh, why should investors pay attention to factors? Yeah, so uh, factors are um, ways that academics have very simplistically tried to understand why stocks do what they do, right? And what they found is value investing, buying cheap stocks relative to buying expensive stocks had, had this premium, right? Like value stocks did better than cheap stocks, but value stocks also did better than the market, right? The same thing goes for momentum, buying winning stocks did better than buying the losing stocks and winning stocks also did better than the market portfolio. So factors are a way that academics have been able to say, hey, we're going to try to understand and explain stock returns using an R squared and a regression. And if you use the market portfolio, you can only explain like 60 to 65 percent of the returns. If you add in you know, five or five other factors, you can explain 96 plus percent. So that's kind of what factors are. Uh, and there's not too many. It's basically size, value, momentum, uh, profitability, or quality um, that, that you need to add to a model to basically understand all the stock returns. Great. And which fa those factors, are those are the ones that have actually held up over time to so the value, size, correct, momentum? <laughs> They are, um, you know, sizes of all of them, which one's like disputed, right? Some some have disputed size relative to the other ones. Um, but those are the main factors that people have looked at. Mm -hmm. And if the factors have been proven to work, the question is why aren't more fund managers and professional portfolio managers really putting an emphasis on investing in them? Why aren't they following them continuously? Yeah, so there's a couple of reasons. Uh, well, a couple, a couple of explanations. One is historically, um, you know, uh, some portfolio managers did simply just use factors, right? Like if you were a value investor, you you followed the value, uh, the value thing. Uh, nowadays there are a second. Nowadays there are a ton of what's called like factor ETFs and even factor mutual funds out there. So investors can use these. Um, but then the third thing is, you know, if you're just a pure active manager. Uh, you know, and you're, let's say, discounting cash flows on a firm, you don't necessarily care. Like if you go back to, you know, we're just going to project out earnings for a company and discount it back to today and come to a decision. Hey, with my discounting of Apple, it just in it, for a quick example, if I discount my projected earnings with my projected weighted average cost of capital, I think Apple's worth 200. If it's trading at 130, I'm going to buy it, right? Um, so factors are kind of static because they're just looking at like one measure, which is like point in time, which is like your PE multiple or book to market for value or your momentum. What is your pre previous momentum? So a lot of active managers who are just discounting using methods that are taught in all schools across the country, uh, they don't care as much about factors. So that's probably one X, the biggest explanation for why not everybody cares about factors. And given the fact that some factors do underperform over periods of time, uh, what suggestions can you give to individual investors about setting their expectations accordingly uh, in terms of having to deal with the possibility they could underperform for a certain period? Yeah, so going into any factor investment, just like any active investment, right? Uh, an investor needs to be aware and understand that there can be time periods of underperformance, right? So for example, value investing before 2021 had underperformed the market as well as growth stocks, like the FANG stocks would be an example of growth stocks. So value as a factor is underperformed for like five plus years. The same thing happened in the lead up to the internet bubble. Value underperformed growth for five plus years. Um, size the past uh, you know, five plus years has underperformed the market. We all know the FANGs are massive stocks, right? So if you were investing in mega caps, you would have done better than investing in small cap stocks. So for investors, the expectation needs to be that at times factors will underperform. 
and you need to adjust accordingly, right? So some people don't care and they will go all in on factors. For other people, you just have to hedge your bet and you say, I'm going to start with the market portfolio, right? So you start with it being 100. But if you want to add factors, maybe, you know, you just do 80% the market, 20% factors, right? And you can adjust accordingly. So uh, I would say there's no perfect answer on how to approach it. But what you can do in, and what you should know is going into it, it will underperform at times. Great. Thanks, Jack. Uh, you all watching this video can see more about uh, factors and learn more about them in the August AI Journal, uh, where Jack and I have a great conversation about factors and some uh, helpful insights about understanding factors and how to use them in your portfolio. Hi all, if you weren't aware, we record this show in advance of the broadcast date and we do like to answer questions in our listener mailbag segment. We didn't receive any questions for this episode of the show in advance, and so I just wanted to remind our viewers and listeners that you can do so. If you have questions for us for any future episode or anything you have seen or read from AAII content, please send an email to kworth at aaii.com with the subject line I, I show question. We will try to get it on air for next episode. And now a word from our friends at Discover Bank, sponsor of the Individual Investor Show and AAII webinars. We know as individuals in interested in building investor wealth, you never want your money to be idle. Even small dollar amounts for short amounts of time should be working for you. With that, we're pleased to share information from our partner, Discover Bank, on deposit accounts that keep your money moving. You can choose from several options to help you meet your short-term or long-term financial goals. The best part? All of the deposit accounts offer preferred member rates. Please take a look. If you liked our show, please visit aaii.com slash webinars to register for more webinar and video content. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at aaii underscore invest underscore ed. For more investing education, check out our site aaii.com. I want to thank our guests, Derek Hageman, Adam Shegg, Dylan Deese, and Jack Vogel, and you for listening. See you next time.